Good morning. Is this working well? Any review of the situation of Domènech i Montaner's work at the Palau de la Música Catalana should start, in my view, uh, based on the no sentisme times uh, discredit, which uh, dubbed the palace as the Palace of Catalan Trinkets. After that, the, well, esteem and the consideration of this palace uh, has changed over time and it has begun, become one of the landmarks of 20th century Catalan and even European architecture, as uh, Hans Ebeling explains in his uh, European Architecture Contemporary History, published in 2011. I thought it was important to bring some testimonies of what of the kind of work that has been done at the School of Architecture and uh, to talk about what students say about uh, the Palau de la Musica because uh, a student is a virgin brain, an, on, an unconditioned brain, much more than than the those who are well older and who are more obsessed about their own ideology. So, in this first slide, we can see that this image that has been given of the visual chaos, the material and ideological disorder of modernism is not such a thing, and that you can clearly identify the rationality of the layout and the structure of the Palau de la Musica. And here, in this other image, you can see that the Palau de la Musica is located for different reasons at the center of uh, the old part of town and besides creating a functional building Domenic is also um, carrying out another task which is uh, to create a building that plays a specific role in this in this district of Barcelona the third part of the building, the top part of the building, is devoted to underscoring the, president, the presence of the building inside the city itself and to present, uh, to create a sort of a landmark as, for instance, uh, the bell towers into the old part of town. And the first two floors are devoted to creating the purpose of the building, so to creating light and so on. It has also been said that this kind of modernism is a speaking architecture because it speaks clearly, it speaks out. We can see that many of those period buildings, the auditorium that were built in Leipzig, Vienna, or many other cities, or in, in Geneva, which was presented by Mr. Cabot, the president of the Orfeo Catalan, and uh, it was, it was uh, well, taken as a post potential model for the uh, Palau de la Musica here in Catalonia, all those buildings tried to explain what their purpose was by placing a sign with the names of the most uh, important uh, composers and musicians uh, at the Concert Gebau, at the Victoria Hall in Geneva. These are some examples of how they do that. However, Domenech went further than that. So it doesn't only place some challenges inside the building, but also in the buttress and in the overweight that is needed to find the balance between the inner thrust of the slab floor. Instead of uh, creating an abstract image, he placed busts of some of the most important composers. Here we see the busts in the main facade and I challenge you to say who they are. I guess that they are uh, well known. Another important feature that has been often underlined about the Palau de la Musica is the virtue it uh, constantly shows. This ambiguity between transparency and uh,
and uh, glazing and the veil or the blurring. So everything is seen, everything is visible, visible, but it's also sort of blurry in uh, this dream world. And uh, that's something that he used to try and uh, place a distance between their building and the buildings nearby, which were really close, like about less than six, six meters. And this is something we, the previous example was from Millet Hall. As I said a minute ago, one of the ideas Dominic had for this uh, Palau de la Musica was this dream-like space, uh, a space for imagination. And this is not only in the concert hall, but it starts at the very lobby and it continues all over the palace in all the different corners. Here we see these diaphragms diaphragms that overlap and create this image and you don't really know if this is a reality or if these are reflections on a mirror on several mirrors so you travel across this palace by crossing these fields of illusion of transparencies and uh, suggestions The previous slide showed the main symmetry going into the main uh, concert hall. However, these illusions uh, are repeated in other spaces, especially in non-symmetrical spaces. This is, for instance, the connection between the staircase and uh, the inner part of the building. We often hear about the Palau de la Musica and something is uh, forgotten because Domènech y Montané was, uh, had a clearly in mind that the whole purpose of this exercise was simply to listen to music. So everything is geared at this uh, purpose, at the goal of having this visual convergence from all the different locations. Uh, and for instance, the fact that the different stories, the different floors are set back so that people could look into the concert. Anyway, I have some friends, I have a friend who says that it's better to find a seat that uh, has no good vision because in that way, well, it's cheaper and then you can spend your time by looking at the pleasures of our, the palace architecture. Everything is geared at finding this excellent framing of the of the stage in many theaters uh, once uh, you have pulled the um, curtains uh, if there's no action well then the stage is an empty place it's a vacuum place uh, there is no role to play by that stage however at the Palau de la Musica that's not the case and there's an ambiguity at play here because it is true that the audience uh, sits in the in the audience area but it's also in the on the stage because for instance the proscenium seats are a sort of a mirror of what's going on for the rest of the audience needless to say in modernist about modernism a lot has been said about arts and crafts integration this is a clear example showing that uh, an idea of st structure and the structure of uh, the construction can combine other arts, such as, uh, in this case, uh, Eusebi Arnau's bust of Beethoven. Domenech was very keen on creating open spaces, open plan, open floor spaces, uh, because he wanted to do things that could be used for multiple purposes. So in the way he re... Well, it, this has been uh, blatant in the way uh, that uh, his buildings have been used and reused over the years. Uh, for instance, here where we find the restaurant, we have had 
seven different types of uses. And this is the millet hall, which can become a classroom for explanations to children, school children who visit the palace. And this space has a sort of seamless continuity outdoors, uh, following the same argument of architecture, which is uh, space creation. Domenic had to find a supporter for the cantilever roofs and he created this uh, circulation space. Of course, he could have done that with just uh, one row of columns. However, he decided to create this two rows of pillars, all different, and create thus this uh, illusion of uh, a dream world. This picture, which is very well known by all of you because this is the first thing that you see when you walk into the concert hall, Use, well, is an example of this uh, palace uh, ornament uh, which uh, is able to do the transition between the pictorial plane to the third dimension of sculpture is a way of uh, fully combining different arts and crafts and it also has a different function which is quite important in architecture. It creates the right scale. The inner space of uh, the Palau de la Musica is huge. I wish it could have been higher. Uh, it would have probably sounded better when large orchestras uh, play in that hall. However, the fact that it's large spectators may find themselves at a loss. However, Domenico Montané skillfully drives spectators towards the stage. How does he do that? By using these figures, uh, which are middle-sized, so that the watcher can start finding the right scale with those who are going to be playing and acting at the on stage. This is a very important uh, image for me. If you look upwards in the ceiling, you will realize how Domenic brings together the structure. This is uh, an orthogonal structure with um, beams and joints with this uh, structures, uh, the chapters uh, that act as, uh, that look like a fan, and uh, this somehow breaks uh, the orthogonal structure rigidity by creating this fluid space. And uh, of course, the integration of uh, this exposed structure, which is very clean and visible, with the different uh, arts and crafts uh, that make it up. I have a theory, which uh, is probably false, uh, that uh, the Palau de la Musica was built based only on the plans which were published in this new paper, uh, newspaper. In this newspaper, La Veu de Catalunya, The Voice of Catalonia in 1905. I'm not sure though, but the fact is that Domenico Montané had to uh, had to create the project in a very short period of time. It is very strange to see that a newspaper, uh, well, if they have to do a piece on, uh, on a building, well, they would place a picture, uh, a picture. And here, it's funny to see that we have the elevations and the plans. It's funny. This is quite weird. Probably this has to do with the fact that the Orfeo Catalao, the promoter of the building, had to state and publicize very clearly that this palace was being built. Uh, and uh, I will quickly explain that this is the... This is the... But this is the plan of the main floor of the, of the Palau. Let me find the pointer. This part of the facade that Domenic can play with is this. From the street, 
you see the facade as if this was a finished building. But obviously enough, if you want to locate such a big concert hall in the plot of land that he had to work with, then the symmetry axis, the axis of symmetry of this uh, hall, which moves onto the scene, will not coincide with the axis of symmetry of the facade. And that's why he played this very well-known trick. He placed uh, the carriage entrance here and then the concert hall is uh, symmetrically placed uh, between the two staircases and here you have the stalls uh, uh, lined up with the stair with the with the stage this is almost the magical idea of architecture. Someone is given a plot of land where uh, it has only one and a half facades and he is able to turn that into four different facades thanks to this courtyard, which uh, he was able to place when the church of San Francisco was still in place there. And with the light coming in from that courtyard, any spectator who would not be familiar with the ins and outs of the project would see the space as if it were symmetrical with two facades one on each side i could speak endlessly about uh, that uh, elevation and how you can see in a thicker line the hard parts of the of the, of the building and how then we see the indications that Domene gives to the different artists uh, and craftspeople to create what we know as the he, big sculpture, the great sculpture of the sculpture from Olot, sorry. Um, the name escapes at this moment, uh, I am 81, so my memory is uh, flawed at the moment. Here we see another example of the way Domenech y Montane worked. He is not very detailed, however, his hints are good enough so that craftspeople are able to turn his ideas into the realities that we saw in previous pictures. Here you can also see that uh, what I explained earlier, the huge hollow space of the palace uh, focuses on these rather human figures which uh, are a sort of a link with the performance, uh, the human figures which are uh, on the stage. In Inauguration Day, this is Mr. Cavot, he was a very big man, and this is Mr. Domenic, who was a smaller uh, person. Look at his face of concern. Mr. Domenic is quite concerned because of the situation, because the situation was dramatic at the time. This is the plot of land that he was given. It's this little disaster with this ins and outs. This is the old church, and this are the remains of the old monastery which uh, had occupied this plot of land. The palace was built thanks to the masons and engineers who were able to do their job. This is almost impossible to, it's almost impossible to recognize, uh, uh, but it shows uh, the structural rigor and the clarity of thought uh, of this conception. Here we see the Catalan vaults, uh, the timbrel vaults, as well as the pillars, uh, which start to integrate the decoration because it was built in a haste, hastily built. And, well, the professor of uh, the School of Architecture, Ignacio Aparicio, discovered that in a book called Entretien from, uh, on architecture by Violette Leduc, uh, there is a, a drawing showing that whenever a metal structure is built with pillars uh, and uh, main beams, this structure can uh, fold down as if it were... Uh, 
A house of cards. Now, this is what Domenic did. This is a model of the Palau de la Musica. Here we see the structure of the concert hall. This is the block where you have the staircases and the access under the stage. It's even easier to see here. Here you would find that this is the behind the scenes. Uh, this is the half circle of the stage and this is uh, the part of uh, the entrance. Let me say that the palace was built thanks to the craftspeople who collaborated with uh, Domenic and Montané. Domenic would draft uh, their invoices, and then the invoices were this. This is uh, an invoice by Mario Magallano, who is a mosaic artist. Uh, he is, um, well, a top-notch uh, mosaic art. Uh, artist, uh, but they were so honest and so good that they simply uh, placed in the items uh, so many meters of mosaic uh, located in such and such a place, uh, 20 pesetas, uh, which is the old currency of Spain, and everything cost uh, 714 pesetas, Spanish pesetas. If we, we were to um, make all the uh, budget meet, uh, we would need a 50-page document. And this is something similar by Regal and Granell, which is a company that lasted for a number of years, and they were the creators of some of the best modernist uh, stained glass windows. Uh, uh, and here we see the details of, of the iron rods uh, and this piece for the skylight and this piece for the window and so on and so on. And uh, this is also something quite interesting. Marta Grassot, director of the Orfeo Catala research center discovered a document, the one you see here on the screen. It's uh, handwritten with Domenech Montanes uh, handwriting and he drafts this certificate stating that the Palau de la Musica is a building with uh, fireproofing as any other public building. At that time, there were some regulations. Uh, you know that regulations are always a pain in the neck. And here you see the royal decree of the 23rd of April 1902 and regulation of the 27th October 1925. These were compuls compulsory documents, things that had to be complied with. And the only thing that the Palau de la Musica didn't comply with was the fact that this kind of buildings had to be uh, standalone buildings. Uh, they had to be, well, to have four facades. And for the, well, shamefully, it had to be uh, built in a rather poor plot of land, of land that didn't have four open facades. So that's why he said, uh, and Domenico Montanez said, I will strengthen the rest of uh, the safety protections. Uh, for instance, all structural elements are covered with uh, uh, brick walls, therefore it cannot be burned. Uh, it will be fireproof, especially the iron parts of the building. And then Domenic also explains that the corridors are all designed uh, to be wide enough uh, as to become escape routes. He also explains that there are three evacuation staircases. Then he also states that balconies uh, were purely decorative uh, or, uh, well, they are actually emergency paths to uh, bring people out of the building because they will be already outdoors if they if they take that path then the uh, rest well the resting rooms are uh, uh, well they all face outdoors and uh, so on and so forth i have been told uh, that uh, my time is up uh, i got a red card but let me mention a uh, recent discovery for those who are studying this. At the moment the Palau de la Musica was being built, the best sculptor in the world, uh, he was a very popular person, he was well known, 
Auguste Rodin, he had started to build what he called the Gates of Hell. This was a fabulous commission for a museum which was supposed to be built in Paris, uh, reflecting different episodes. And these are some of the landmarks of uh, world architecture. Of course, Domenic y Montané could not uh, be aware of uh, the cultural influence that the Gates of Hell by Rodin had. So when he devised uh, the proscenium arch of uh, the stage, uh, when he made the drawings, uh, as I said, uh, as always, these drawings were just uh, a rough uh, guideline for those who would later on have to do the, the job, although he rather daringly wrote down uh, that the scale was 1 to 50. And here we see some wonderful details, such as this cloud uh, that coming out of Beethoven's uh, head and uh, becomes part of the structure of the proscenium arch. So this kind of discoveries uh, of the influence between uh, Rodin and the Gates of Hell and uh, the proscenium march at the Palau have uh, been, well, it's quite, it's quite interesting. And it's interesting as well to see that uh, the Palau de la Musica's managers, uh, well, once, once the pandemic struck and uh, they had to close down, uh, they thought that it would be a good moment uh, to restore the proscenium march. And uh, this is an Italian restorer the person who uh, has spoken before me about uh, the España Hotel knows much, is much more knowledgeable about uh, this kind of things than myself and probably would have been able to, to do a better reading than that. But in any case, let me say that this uh, proscenium arch is a big structure. I don't know if you remember, but on uh, the top, on both sides, uh, there are the two main doors uh, where musicians uh, walk in and out of the stage. And Domenic, this would be the party wall of the Palau, and Domenic decided to build uh, to build one face here, one face there, and to leave one empty space here in the middle, which is also useful to anchor, as has very eloquently been explained by the persons who uh, talked about the Navas uh, Palace, that's where the anchorage of the sculptures uh, would be laid. Uh, so the proscenium march has been wonderfully restored. Uh, it's a pity that due to the current situation, we can hardly uh, see it. I haven't been able to go back as a, as a spectator, but it's really wonderful to see how part of this heritage has been recovered and, uh, well, redone. And let me show you this final image showing the task of restorers, uh, both with uh, these sculptural flowers uh, and on the tiles, uh, as well as on the balusters, uh, and uh, which has been well cleaned up and made uh, as splendorous as it was in the past. Thank you very much.